Hi, this is Andrew O'Hare at Salon.com, and I'm really excited about uh, being joined today by author Naomi Klein, who is the author of uh, uh, works you may have read, such as No Logo and The Shock Doctrine, very influential uh, nonfiction books, and is the author of a really, really interesting new book, which I think is just published this week in the United States called Doppelganger. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you, Andrew. It's good to be with you. It's, it's, now, I, I want to I start with a version of a trick question in that because this book sort of uses um, your relationship or non-relationship with another person named Naomi, and we can get to that uh, as an entry point, I had two people when I started talking about reading your book, two different people that I respect and like, have these very, I thought, you know, noteworthy reactions. One of them basically was like, LOL, what a hilarious concept for, the, for a book. You go ahead and read that if you want to, like <laughs> somewhat dismissive. Mm -hmm. And the second person was like, well, that's the most New York concept I've ever heard of <laughs> for a book. And I mm. thought of interrupting that person and saying, actually, n neither of those people lives in New York now. By New York, did they mean Jew? <laughs> I, I think they meant inside the media, you know, you, but, I mean, you could speculate on various directions if you want to, but I was really struck by what I thought was kind of a defensive reaction mm. um, and also just the leaping to the assumption that you had written some intensely narcissistic account of your perhaps obsessive relationship with this other person yeah. who shares certain characteristics. Have yeah. you run into that before? Um, I mean, I don't think people necessarily share those reactions with me per se, but I was aware that this book would be misunderstood as a concept until like until it entered the world which is part of the reason why we didn't tell anyone about it for like for a much longer time than is the the usual case with publishing usually a book is announced as soon as it's signed by the publisher and we kept it secret for at least a year um, and that was actually hard because we had you know there was there there were a lot of ndas that needed to be signed <laughs> to, to do that and the main reason why we wanted to keep it um, uh, under wraps was precisely because we knew that it would be misunderstood. So there were a couple of months where the con like the, the idea of the book preceded the book, where people were like, oh my God, she wrote an entire book, about and she didn't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, my I will testify, was, yeah. she didn't, yeah. You, no, I mean, <clears throat> Wolf really is kind of like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Oh, that's excellent, yeah. yes, yeah. that's exactly right. Right. I mean, she and and you know, I think she is an interesting case study for a certain kind of political migration from left to right or liberal to right. Um, uh, and her story is interesting, and it, and and it's a thread. But the book is really not about her. It's much more about the 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 phenomenon of doubling and doppelgangers as a as a lens through which to understand the Hall of Mirrors of dig digital culture and personal branding and AI, but also the kind of the doubling that I think we most fear, which is the way whole societies can flip into their evil twins. So yeah, she's a literary technique. Um, and now that the book is out there, I feel actually really gratified that people are getting it. Um, oh, that's good, yeah. But there had to be a period where, listen, even my, my parents were like, what? <laughs> Well, you go at this pretty directly in the book, the sense, the, the sense that there is a certain sense in, this which, in which this was an ill-advised project, and you certainly had people suggesting that to you. Well, the first line is, in my defense, it was never my intent to write this book. No one asked me to, and several people strongly cross-cautioned against it. Some of them were in my own family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, 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 I, I think you've laid out a lot, a lot of the themes. And we are, yes, we are talking about Naomi Wolf, the author of the, of the Beauty Myth, who has sometimes been confused with Naomi Klein, and they are not the same person, to be clear. And Naomi Wolf has become, I, I hope I'm not exaggerating the case, something of a COVID denialist associated with right wing figures like Steve Bannon uh, on the internet, uh, all sorts of controversial and conspiratorial movements, things like that. We don't need to dwell on that, but the, the, the concept of doubling that you talk about, one of the really interesting things for me is when you discuss the idea of the doppelganger, the person who is confused for you, the person who is in some ways like you, as a kind of mirror. And the idea that Naomi Wolf became a kind of mirror image for you and the entire sphere of things that she represents became 
a dark mirror for a lot of the things in normal politics, left politics, liberal politics. That's fascinating. How did you, how did, what was the process that took you there to that analysis? Well, you know, I think there's something very interesting about having a doppelganger in that it, <clears throat> You know, we live in a society where insecurity is rampant, um, interpersonal insecurity, economic insecurity. And one of the things that we have been sold collectively about how we can um, hold on with our fingernails in, in, in this culture is by building our own brand. Um, and so there was one point where somebody online said, well, Naomi Klein should sue Naomi Wolf for trademark infringement. And I just thought that was really funny because you know, my first book was called No Logo, and it was about Indeed. the rise of, of uh, this idea of the lifestyle brand, but also the human brand, right? So it was tracking the first stage of this idea that humans sh should fashion themselves as products. And, and I almost feel like the concept of the personal brand didn't quite exist when you wrote that book, at least not in the way that it does now. It, it existed for celebrities. So, right, so I have a whole chapter about Michael Jordan's agent saying that he was the first super brand and, you know, Richard Branson and Oprah. Um, but the idea that everyday people who don't have marketing firms behind them could be brands was a silly idea that, that we understood in our 90s brains <laughs> <laughs> to be you know, essentially a SOP that was being offered to us instead of job security, right? Like, don't worry, you all got laid off. You can be your own brands right, and all right. will be well. <laughs> and so it wasn't until, you know, No Logo came out just on the cusp of 1999 and 2000. You know, a few years later, the iPhone come, you know, happens, Facebook, later Twitter. And so then this, this idea that we thought was absurd becomes actually feasible. You can... Uh, you've got a marketing agency in your back pocket with your iPhone and, and social media. It takes very little um, sort of overhead to, to, to create that sort of glowing, perfected, idealized version of yourself, whatever that may be. Um, and I had always wanted to go back to that material because it has changed so much. And because I had this weird experience after No Logo was published of having a lot of journalists accuse me of being a brand because the yeah. book, you know... Um, did kind of turn me into a brand. There was a line of No Logo olive oils that somebody launched, wow. as well as a No Logo restaurant in Geneva that was pretty seedy. Uh, <laughs> a good craft beer in England. So wow. the whole thing, I, to be honest with you, I just ran screaming in the other direction because this was like not, yeah. what, not what I had intended. So, you know, my later books, The Shock Doctrine and, and This Changes Everything, really had nothing to do with marketing or branding. And that was kind of me being a bad brand and just trying to kind of get back to basics of why I wanted to be a journalist and do this work. Um, but it was nagging away at me that actually there was something very important going on with, this, what, with the way the logics of branding had entered our very souls and our interpersonal relationships and our channels of communication and our social movements. And this is a really critical uh, piece that preoccupies me of like yeah. what that does to our ability to organize and be in solidarity. So it occurred to me that I had been given a kind of a gift, uh, which was my own branding crisis, to come back to it, but not at a distance, but really to come back to it from the inside, you know, to wrestle with, yeah, I have a branding crisis, and also I don't believe in brands, so what do we do with that? <laughs> right, there's, there's a, I, and that's very well put, because I think that essential kind of contradiction or conflict is, is at the heart of, of of what this book is about. I, even thinking back on the two people who said those things to me about what they assumed your book to be about, they were leaping to a conclusion that it was essentially a defense of your personal brand against somebody who, who had infringed on it. And that immediately puts their, what they were thinking in the universe of this book, which is to me about a certain crisis of what the self means. And you write about this very, very well in this book, I think. The, what, the, what the self means in whatever we want to call the society, liberal capitalism or something like that, um, and the way that it really interferes with solidarity, with community, yeah. things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think what it comes down to is this is hard work. This is labor, like the labor of constructing a perfected self in the form of the, the, the brand that must be maintained through repetition, through discipline, other forms of doubling that I look at 
in the book, like the perfected body, because of course this I the idealized, well fit, immuno strong body became very political during COVID because that was one of the um, the diagonal lines between the far right and the far out, as I call it, was yeah. like this this wellness um, this the, a particular sh stream in the wellness world that had sold this idea that that you can deal with all of your fears and insecurities um, by perfecting your own body, right? It's a kind of like body prepperism. Um, and, and, and then even the way we, you know, perfect our kids, you know, and think of our kids as almost brand extensions. So we think about the Trumps, you yeah. know, um, like a family of brand extensions. So that's an extreme example, but... but um, yeah, it's a valid example, unfortunately, yeah. What it comes down to for me is, you know, what aren't we building when we're building our brands? Because all of this is a lot of work. It is not a small undertaking to, to do that much performing and polishing and perfecting and optimizing. And we are only on this earth for a finite number of hours. And we can tell ourselves that, oh, this isn't really me. I'm just doing this because I have to do it. But ultimately, we do happen to be living at a time where we are confronting these intersecting and interlocking emergencies of surging authoritarianism, the climate crisis being, you know, banging down our doors, um, and 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 just gaping inequalities and injustices. So as all of those crises, you know, uh, um, fuel one another, and I think they are fueling one another. Definitely, we we have a lot of work to do, and it isn't work that we can do as atomized individual. It's, it, we, 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 these are global forces. If we stand a chance in hell, it's because we get out of our own way and out of our own heads and act in true solidarity and camaraderie uh, with one another. And so that's, that's what interests me, is, like, is, is, is the labor of the self and, and the kind of theft that it is from the labor of building those networks and, and, and structures. Communities and social movements yeah. and, and, and those things. Yeah. I do want, I, I, I know we, I feel like we could kind of go on indefinitely, but I do want you to talk a little bit about what you refer to as the mirror world that someone like uh, Naomi Wolf became a part of. That whole universe uh, that ha is really a fairly recent invention and really driven partly by the COVID pandemic in which uh, Steve Bannon, uh, Alex Jones, an entire universe of right-wing influencers and conspiracy theorists. Um, and one of the things that, you point out a lot of really interesting things. One of them is that those people are providing a sense of community, even if yeah. it's a fake or dangerous sense of community for the people who follow them. The other one is that for those of us who think of ourselves as the normal people with rational views to completely dismiss them mm -hmm. and not look at them seriously is to not take, is to not really look in the mirror. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think that's all right. And you know, you were mentioning um, those reactions to the book and another reaction I got, which was not, oh, why, why would you be doing this for your brand or what? It was, why would you give them attention? Why would you, why would you, why would you, uh, why would you give them a platform? Why, and, sure, and, we hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and I find that one the most interesting because, I mean, frankly, it's so arrogant <laughs> it, to imagine that we are the ones in control <laughs> of all of the attention. Yeah. And if we don't give them our attention, they basically don't exist. And that was one of the things that interested me most about her was that when she, you know, she, she did spread a lot of medical misinformation, particularly around vaccine shedding and its impact on uh, supposed impact on fertility. And, and, and um, I, I, I think that was part of the reason why she was deplatformed from Twitter for a while. She is back. There was something else. There was that. I think there was something about bioweapons that may have been the trigger. I don't know what it was. But um, when she was kicked off Twitter, you know, she had been one of left and liberal Twitter's favorite punching bags sure. for a long time. a long time. I should know, because I often took the blows. Um, <laughs> there was like this, there was literally a tweet that was like, ding dong, the witch is dead. And there was this I much, much one, yes. rejoicing, um, mean little video montages of all of her, you know, worst takes. Um, 
And the real feeling was she has been deleted from planet Earth. And because I had already started this research, what I knew was that, in fact, she had a much larger platform. Uh, she was on Bannon's show in some periods every single day. He has millions of listeners. Um, every single day for a week, for two weeks she was on. She's more like a co-host than a regular guest. She's on very, very often. At one point they published a book together. They've put out t-shirts together. I mean, it's the oddest buddy movie you could yes. really yes. imagine. Um, she was also on Tucker Carlson's show before he, he had that yanked. But the point is, you know, she's been on Jordan Peterson. Like, we, we do not have the power <laughs> to make them disappear. And this idea that just by denying them attention, we are going to somehow minimize their power. No, we should give them attention and understand what is happening. And that's what I tried to do. I'm not, it's obviously not uncritical attention, but oh, I'm trying yeah. to understand what the appeal is. I want to understand less what she's getting out of Bannon, which is obvious. She's getting a, a, a platform where she lost one. She, but what is he getting out of her? You know, what, is it, what does it mean for him to make an alliance with this you know, prominent feminist Democrat sure. um, uh, you know, who on some level stands for everything that he opposes? Um, so yeah, I've, I've, and also it's interesting. I, I'm interested in how when something becomes an, an issue in, the mirror, in what I call the mirror world, um, it then becomes untouchable in our right. worlds. Yeah, right. so it's like once they say it, then we have to just do the opposite. And considering that Bannon's skill as a strategist is looking at the people and issues that the Democratic Party has abandoned and kind of mixing them in with his pre-existing xenophobic, um, you know, racist agenda uh, and authoritarian agenda, that's very, the worst thing we can do is just be reactive and say, oh, well, if they're talking about surveillance, we're not. If they're talking about big pharma, we're not. You know, uh, it, it's, just, it's almost like reverse marionettes. Yeah, it, 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 I think this is, should be obvious to people, but sometimes it isn't, that um, you don't have to agree with anything that is said in the mirror world to understand that the anxieties that drive people there are real. Anxieties about uh, technological surveillance yep. are real. Uh, big pharma, yeah, anxieties also about real. The, the, the big pharmaceutical yep. corporations, and even as you point out, the question—it was really dumb that the question of how um, COVID actually started became politicized in the particular way that it did. Yep. We, we don't know. I don't know. You don't know. We probably will never know. But to decide that it had to be one answer, basically for tribal or political reasons, yeah. was was another example of giving those people a gift to me. Oh, absolutely. And you know, for, you know, I've been watching Bannon, you know, do this move uh, for a while because, you know, I came up in the alter globalization movement, and sure. we had a really strong critique of these corporate free trade deals. That was like a centerpiece of the movements that of I was course. a part of, and those issues were really abandoned by the Democratic Party and by center-left parties around the world. And now we, you know, I, we're watching them turn into this warped mirror in the hands of Bannon, in the hands of Giorgio Malone in Italy. Um, and it worked in 2016. So we should be yeah. paying very, very close attention to what issues are being warped in the mirror world ahead of 2024. And I think, I think it's a little bit of a problem when, you know, the Democrats do something like they basically they figured out that the, these free trade deals, so-called, were, yeah. were unpopular and possibly also destructive. Mm -hmm. So they kind of dropped it and they don't talk about it anymore. And to me, that's like, is that kind of erasure really helpful? Like they've just forgotten <laughs> that for 25 years or 30 years, they supported these things that are now unpopular. To me, that's a, a bizarre absence in itself. Yeah, it's, it, it is. And, and I mean, it's not only Bannon, we're talking about Bannon, but look at, you have somebody like RFK, whose whole campaign Absolutely. You know, is sort of like a weird doppelganger of Bernie's campaign in the sense that it, he's, he's actually quite good at naming corporate capture of regulatory agencies, taking on the military industrial complex, you know, you know, he'll, he'll, he's, he's, he's sometimes when he talks about big pharma, I agree with him a lot of the time. I don't, especially when he's peddling vaccine autism myths and, and yeah. but, but the, but the real issue is he doesn't have an offer. Like he's not talking about universal health care like Bernie was. He's not talking about raising the minimum wage like Bernie was. He's just using the juice in these issues that are no longer really front of you know the discourse uh, among Democrats and 
seeding ground is very dangerous and you can't blame strategists for being strategic and it's very strategic to pick up the issues and the people that uh, your opponents have carelessly left uh, unattended. And it, it, is it a mistake to always, to sort of always default to the view that the people in that, in the mirror universe are driven by uh, the coarsest possible factors like racism and, and greed, for example, those certainly play a role, mm. but is it a mistake not to attribute some uh, genuine beliefs or genuine ideology to those people? I think it's a mistake to generalize <laughs> uh, generally about those people because it's we're talking about a huge sector of the population and it's absolutely the case that there are people who are driven primarily by white supremacy it's and and it's it's absolutely the case that people are some people are gen like their number one issue is 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 anti-transness is transphobia but it's a pretty it's a it's a pretty motley crew that we're talking about here um, and one of the things that interests me is that there's very little um, ed economic education in our culture. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, like none, there's very yeah. little political education, but in terms of actually understanding how the economy works, um, like how capitalism, the system we're all inside, works, how it functions, I don't know. I did not learn it in school. And if you do learn about it, you're going to learn that it's you know freedom and, the, and, and French fries and rainbows and the best possible system. And I think because of that lack of economic literacy in terms of what the system was built to do, that it is a system that is pretty much an a enclosure and, 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 and profit-making machine, and um, the, you know, the, the history of neoliberal capitalism that I tell in, in the shock doctrine has some conspiracies in it. I mean, I'm talking to you sure. on the 50th anniversary of the overthrow of Salvador Allende, and yes, you are. there's some pretty conspiratorial uh, behaviors that led to that event. Um, and we have the paper, we have the documents. What interests me about conspiracy culture, and I, and I call it culture as opposed to theories, because there's often not a, th a real coherent theory. There's a, it's throwing stuff at the wall. It's, it's more like climate change denialism, where you just kind of um, just say, hey, it's sunspots, it's not happening, it's yeah. happening, but we'll be fine. I mean, the point is to spread doubt. But I think that really a lot of what is motivating people is, is, is that they were told that this system was fair and their experience is it's not fair. They know they're getting screwed. And, and, and that combination... Difficult to argue with that. It, yeah. yeah. But when you don't have, um, you know, you don't have anybody who's actually explaining to you how the, this economy was built and giving you any, any kind of systemic analysis, if somebody says, oh, come over here, it's actually a room full of Jews, right? That is yeah, sorry to laugh. going yeah. to... This is why this is why um, anti-Semitism was was called the, the the socialism of fools, and it's why the Trotskyists and you know the rest of them took ed political education so seriously because, in a sense, you could see all of those sort of pamphlets explaining the system as a way of saying it's you know it's not it's not just the the money lender who's responsible for all of your all of your woes. This is actually a system that was built to have an underclass. It has to have an underclass in order to function. Um, so yeah, I think we should try to understand that. And we should try to be um, doing that work. Uh, and it's not going to get everybody. And there's definitely lots of people who are never coming back from those worlds. But I don't think that we should be writing everyone off. I do need to, to let you go, but I wanted to touch on one final point, which is you, you discussed this in the book, and you discussed it in an interview in The New Yorker that I just read. Um, the difficulty of writing from the perspective of a leftist or progressive when you feel like you're saying the same things over and over again and it's not necessarily working. I have felt that personally and professionally for the last several years and it felt like this book was your way of writing yourself out of that. Did it work? It did work. Yeah, thanks for asking. <laughs> you know, I think I, I was feeling depleted from a content perspective of just like, okay, am I just going to say the exact same thing again? We really are out of time. We really need to do this. And I, because I, I couldn't face, I did, I lost faith in that, in that, in that register for my voice. I thought, well, maybe if I can get interested in form, then I'll remember why I wanted to be a writer in the first place. And and, and that was originally the, the, what drew me to this project was that it was interesting formally to look, to take having a doppelganger as a, 
as a narrow aperture to look at a little more lightly um, at all of these different uh, um, areas that interested me. But in the end, I got interested in the content too, and I do feel that it's had a kind of a steadying effect on me personally, out of where I started in a very vertiginous state. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was, there really is a therapeutic aspect to this book, in addition to the, the, the political aspect. It will make you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Naomi Klein, the author of Doppelganger, published this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew.